Hello and welcome to Bio Exam Prep IS. As part of a comprehensive news analysis, today we'll be discussing seven to eight interesting topics out of the Hindu newspaper. But before we begin, an important reminder for you that as part of our target prelims program, today we have the second session for science and technology at 7:30 on YouTube itself. And if you remember, it is part of a larger plan for a crash course on YouTube itself. It's a free crash course, and we are discussing questions through which we are discussing issues. So today is the second session of science and technology. Thereafter, tomorrow is going to be the third session. Then we'll go into international relations, then government schemes, art and culture, reports and indices, and places in news. So therefore, the coverage is as comprehensive as possible. We've already gone through. Economy, polity, and environment, and I hope that you have gone through these sessions. If you haven't, you should. They are all available on YouTube and on our channel itself. Now, with this, let's look at the topics we are going to discuss today. Generally, first is the G20 and the SCO summit. SCO has been in the news quite a lot, but there's a very interesting perspective which has been put in by the editorial about the obstacles which India has in G20 and SCO. Thereafter, smart metering systems and how it is the future for electricity management in India. Then we are going to talk about the go first stall or the bankruptcy which has which it has actually filed for, and how it is something systemic to the industry itself that these low cost airlines are going under. Then we'll move into smaller but interesting topics from Project Sanjay, under which there is a real time surveillance concept being introduced by the army. Then we'll talk about this interesting EU tax, which is now going to be a problem for our low income or what we call as lower and low, uh, the middle exporters in that regard. Further, we'll talk about gold uh, metal we all love. Thereafter, we'll talk about the concept of nuclear power, how we are trying to pivot towards nuclear power, and we don't allow FDI under nuclear power. How are we thinking about changing that? And last but not the least is a change for you, generally for the prelims examination, where they've changed the name of a scheme, and that is going to be important for the examination generally. Now, with this, good morning. Let's start our discussion for today. And the first topic is by N. K. Narayanan, a very, very well known and very respected editorial author itself. And because he was already a national security advisor, his basic the suggestions and what he's saying in this article is quite interesting and it has to be incorporated into your into your preparation now when we talk about articles there are two type of articles one is solution giving the other one is which gives you problems or flags issues this is that type of article which tells you the obstacles the problems which we are going to face or are facing and how we need to change our approach in the larger perspective so when we talk about G20 and SEO, first we'll try to understand what are the countries which come under G20 and SEO, and then we'll talk about the larger argument as always, larger, then go into the nitty gritty, and then summary in the end. So just to refresh your memory, G20 is part of this larger concept of G7, G8, and G20. Under G20, India and China get integrated into this smaller group of G7 in that regard, where the US, the UK, Japan, and France, Germany, Italy, along with Canada operate. As of right now, India has the presidency of G20, which is quite significant in that regard. But as you can see, there are certain combinations in this G20, which are problematic for Indian foreign policy generally. So if you look at it, India and China in itself is problematic. Thereafter, you have the US and Russia, which becomes problematic. Then Russia, China, as of right now, is becoming a problem for India and the US itself. Thereafter, we are seeing that Australia, Japan, and the India and US quad itself is being countered by Russia and China. So therefore, it's a very interesting set of countries. And that is why India, being the president of the G20 itself, it is significant that India is talking about a lot of important things like climate change, sustainable development. But what the article is pointing out is that if you look at the basic geopolitics here, there are enough roadblocks and obstacles for nothing to be achieved generally. And if you look at the SCO, SCO has one of the biggest irritants in Indian foreign policy, which is Pakistan. You have China, Pakistan, India, Tajikistan, Uzbekistan, Kyrgyzstan, Kazakhstan, and Russia. And the latest addition, which is going to be Iran, which in itself is 
a problematic aspect vis-a-vis -vis larger geopolitics itself. This is the ninth member which has been added. April of 2023, it has become a member, not indicated in the map of the UN. Now, when we talk about Pakistan, China, India and Russia being on the same forum, now it again becomes problematic because China, Pakistan and Russia as of right now is one tripartite which is working. On the other hand, India does not have a direct partner vis-a-vis -vis the new configurations which we are working with. For example, the US is not there, Australia is not there, Japan is not there. So therefore, in the SCO, which is, which is ongoing summit in Goa itself, there's a lot of questions which are being raised that how does India-Russia relationship, how does India-Pakistan relationship, how does India-China relationship go forward. So this was the static portion of this area wherein we've just discussed what are the G20 members, don't have to learn each and every year country but the point of the matter is you need to be cognizant of the geopolitics within it and further the SCO which again has the most interesting set and as of right now what is being believed that even the BRICS wherever India, China and Russia are together it is now becoming more and more redundant and therefore therefore when we talk about the SCO or we talk about BRICS or generally the G20 there are a lot of tensions which are playing together. So before we go into the larger argument or what the author is trying to talk about, let's try to summarize everything into a nutshell and basics in that regard. So India has a lot of important targets as the G20 president. India wants to achieve a new understanding of art and culture, wants to push its soft power. We want to talk about antiquities and how they are being smuggled. We are talking about sustainable development, about climate change. We are also talking about terrorism at one level. The point is G20, G20 is being used by India as a form of pushing India's role as a superpower in the larger geopolitics of the world. However, there are three major problems here. First is that there, are, there is this combination which India has to maneuver, which India has to maneuver wherein the tensions between US and Russia are at the highest at this point of time because of the Ukraine issue itself. Further, China becomes a new angle in it because China is coming closer and closer to Russia as Russia is moving away from the US and away from India in that regard. So how does India fit in in this concept wherein it has to go closer to the US which automatically pushes it away from China and Russia. So therefore, the first irritant, the first obstacle in making G20 a very productive political concept or political organization is going to be this configuration, wherein India has to maneuver at the same point of time a good US relationship, but also a all weather relationship with the Russians. And therefore, China becomes a major issue within it because Russia, China as of right now is pulling Russia away from India. And therein comes a second issue which India has to face, which is in both these bodies, China is there to undercut diplomatically, strategically and generally the schemes which are there for China vis-a-vis -vis using even, even the UNESCO World Heritage Committee to do politics against Australia. So as of right now, you can see somehow we are getting caught up into the same geopolitics. And if that was not enough, that was not enough. We also have Pakistan in one of the organizations, which is the SCO. Now, Pakistan, they have only one issue. But the problem is that is undercutting any form of talks which could help generally South Asia going forward. So the problem is that India again has to maneuver this very problematic relationship with these two neighbors who have always been together. Further, the last but not the least issue is Russia itself. Because we are now going into a period of uncertainty because the more we go towards Ukraine or towards the NATO countries, the more Russia goes towards China. So there's a major push and pull which is happening here, wherein India has to balance all of these countries together, which in itself is extremely difficult because balancing Russia is easier because of the larger relationship, because defense partnership is already there. But balancing US, Russia, Pakistan, China at the same point of time means that we need to find a way in order to isolate our relationships with each one of them and not let the larger geopolitics of the world affect it. Because we know that we have been ambivalent vis-a-vis -vis Ukraine. We have not ever, we have abstained from voting in the UNSC itself. However, however, that doesn't mean that Russia is very, very grateful. Russia needs us for its defense. 
Russia needs us as of right now because the oil exports to Europe is not direct. It is through India itself. And if you've seen the data, close to 36 to 36 to 38 percent. Let's take it as approximately 40 percent of all crude oil as of right now is coming from Russia only. So Russia, because it has not been able to export it to Europe, it is now exporting it to India. And the irony is Europe is taking it from India. So the share of share of Iran and the African countries has gone down. Russia has gone up. So Russia needs us. But the problem is Pakistan and China. And more than that, if we become too cozy with Russia, then the US angle goes out of the picture. So this article technically flags these three major issues that the way we have to maneuver G20 or even SCO is that we have to balance all three together the US, Russia, China, Russia and China, Pakistan complex, which in itself is problematic in the larger context of geopolitics. So this is the basic point which it is trying to make wherein it is flagging. So we'll talk about the way forwards. But as I told you, two types of articles, this is not the solution giving article, it is the flagging issue article. Now, let's look at the basic argument which the article is making and let's go to the nitty gritty. I hope that basic point is clear. So when we talk about G20 and SEO, India has very persisting challenges in order to make sure that G20 and SEO can become better or we can achieve what we want to achieve within this organization. Now, the point is that India has been talking about a lot of things, climate change, clean energy, sustainable development, reforms in multilateral institutions, but all have taken backseat because of the global situation itself. And further, the deteriorating geopolitical situation with Kremlin actually shooting a drone allegedly from Ukraine over the Kremlin itself. Further, Russia and Ukraine going into now even the nuclear zone via Belarus. There is a lot of significant irritants and problems which are developing in the larger context of how Russia-Ukraine is going, which is dividing the world into that east and west in that regard, the Iron Curtain itself. Further, Further, the first issue which India faces is the distrust which the US and the Russia and China complex has. And India has to now maneuver both of them because India cannot afford to go against the US fully, though it is a very moody power. Though we have had a good relationship with Russia, now Russia is going together with China. And if that was not enough, we generally have the issue of China for diplomatic and strategic offensive strategies which it is generally applying throughout the South Asian sector. Its presence in the, in the South China Sea, in the Indo-Pacific world itself is now becoming problematic. And the more India goes towards the Quad or tries to bring in Japan or Australia, the more it is then going away from Russia, the more it is going away from China. So that is the problem that diplomatically we have to maneuver very well. If that was not enough, we, we can add Pakistan to this issue. And then Pakistan has no issue, but only one issue. So therefore, the problem is that we then need to maneuver Pakistan within SEO in such a way. And our foreign minister has been very, very vocal in the past two days about how Pakistan still is and will remain the epicenter of terrorism. And at the end of the day, they have only one issue, which is that they want to meddle into internal politics of India. And the simple point of the matter is they are illegally occupying a very, very important part of India and that needs to stop. So Pakistan, according to them, everything is perfect. We are not engaging, but we will not engage if our soldiers are going to lose their lives for these very petty issues. So therefore, therefore, we will not engage till the violence does not end. They will only engage on issues which don't matter to us in the larger perspective because they're internal issues and they should not be discussed at the foreign level itself. So the third issue, which again is pointed out by this article is that if we look at the larger India Russia relationship, that is also going into a phase of uncertainty because the more we go towards the US for weaponry, for generally making the relationship better, the more we are going to go out of the Russian radar and Russia goes towards China. And th the major point is when Russian the, the defense minister very, very ardently, very vocally criticized the Quad in New Delhi recently. It was very clear what is the Russian orientation towards this area. As it is any organization where Russia, India and China are together, they are more or less going into limbo. And as it is, they are not working. 
because because their configuration india and russia used to be a good relationship but now india and russia itself is becoming problematic and therefore china is able to pull russia out of this relationship and the general general communist history and the fact that the chinese have the money and the russians don't have the money for the state of art technology which they have so the point which this article is trying to make is that there are obstacles and you have to overcome them to actually achieve anything if india has to achieve anything so what do you do with this information in the examination a very simple question can be what are the challenges which india faces vis a vis presidency within g20 and the sco a leadership which has it has taken vis a vis this year now we can't stop here because we are upsc aspirants we have to go one step further and we have to understand the way forward and the concerns generally which are there in the larger context so as i said as i said we understand that the russia china complex along with pakistan is becoming problematic for india on the other hand india and the us is on the other hand an important relationship which is developing and that has been rep represented by the quad itself further the g20 and the sco all have the same issue which is that these three are in some combination there therefore india has to make sure that it can engage with both simultaneously so the first way forward would be that technically to break this relationship and deal with each one of them separately which is china russia and pakistan rather than having a whole engagement with this whole complex or whole security complex in in itself rather we need to go into each one in an isolated way if that is possible it is possible theoretically but on the ground geopolitics is messy on the other hand the us relationship has to be fostered further but the problem in this relationship is ukraine and ukraine as it is is not understanding the importance of india with the recent controversy vis a vis what happened when they used a very important goddess in india in a very 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 petty post in that regard therefore ukraine itself itself is not realizing the importance of india they are trying to sabotage that relationship and generally india has an ambivalent stance over russia ukraine issue generally so if you look at it it's a mess it's a mess and that is what this article is trying to point out so the first basic solution would be to go forward separately to dehyphenate the word which we use in international relations is dehyphenate which is don't have an hyphenate this is a hyphen don't have a hyphenated relationship dehyphenate the relationship and independently deal with each further further the us on the other hand the us on the other hand is a very important defense partner and we need to foster it by actually dealing and inculcating and arguing that that relationship has historical importance but this relationship is equally important the concern remains is that all of this is only leading to more and more complex issues and more than that we are not sure that we are actually going to meet any of the targets which this article tries to point out with this type of geopolitics in the world as of right now so i hope that you understand the basic point of this article i have a question in the end with related to mains with regards to this topic but the basic i'll repeat myself simple point is sco and g20 both india is at a leading position as of right now the problem as of right now is russia china pakistan are engaging in th all three all two which is g20 and and the sco somehow this hyphenated relationship or this interlinked relationship and geopolitics is not allowing india to use these forums to their full potential further the more india goes towards the us the quad generally it moves away from russia and china which is equally problematic because russia is a very important defense partner so this article tries to chalk in the obstacles and the problems generally so i hope this topic is totally clear in your mind and we can move to the next topic generally yes okay perfect right now we go to the second topic which is related to smart metering now in india we have standard meters we have the old one which goes on magnetically we have the new ones which are electric meters now we have this concept of smart meters and what the smart meter concept is that these smart meters record data every 30 minutes they package it and send it to the discom the the com, the companies which give us electricity and the discom
companies can give us the information back in the form of usable data in mobile apps or generally in our bills so that we can understand how are we using electricity. So it's a very interesting concept wherein a smart meter when installed to a house can send certain data to the electricity provider which can then give us that data in a certain way which can be used to understand and also grasp how are we using our energy and that will help us monitor and be made better efficient in using our energy. So if you have a certain appliance which is using too much, the meter will tell us. So if you use a smart meter, you can actually get day, month, season, every season how much you're using. Further, when is the period when the tariffs are lower? Then which appliance is using more energy? Further, then you can replace it and get better. And more than that, it can also allow us to trade solar power if you have a solar power or what we call as solar panels on your roof. So therefore, all can be done through mobile apps. It's technically the internet of, not technically the internet of things, but it has the potentiality of doing that. That basically, the, the data can be used by you and me for a greener future because we will understand where we are using energy in the wrong way and where we can improve generally. So smart meters are the future generally of metering in India. And this article is an optimistic article, which in in which it's actually is trying to give you a certain perspective of how we can harness that potentiality. So this is the optimistic type of article which is telling you how can we make sure that smart metering can become the future of electricity consumption. And more than that, all this data which we use and we have pilot programs which are going on and close to 50 lakh of these meters have been installed. And the results are also very encouraging. We'll go into the results also. But smart metering is the future. Its potentiality needs to be tapped in. How do we do it is what the article is trying to point out in a four step manner. How each and every stakeholder can make sure that we can have a better future in which we understand our energy needs and we are able to use it better also. Because if we have the right data set, if I can understand that my AC is using too much and my AC is three star and my fridge is only five star rated under BE, then I can use a five star AC and reduce my consumption. And if you are reducing consumption, using it more efficiently, it is better for the environment generally. So this is the basic point of this article, which is that smart metering is the future of, of metering in India of electricity consumption. And how can we then harness that potentiality to create a regime for smart meters and generally for smart technology in electricity sector. So it's a very interesting and very important article of GS Paper 3 because it's a new emerging technology. So we have as of right now 5.5 million smart meters which have been installed and 100 million have more been sanctioned and the Basic concept is by 2025-26, by 250 million conventional electricity meters should be changed. If you know the meter basically concept where they, you get the units and that red dot which is there, it, how much units are they using that is used for billing for. Now, the encouraging trend as of right now is that the 5.5 million which have been installed as of right now, the Council for Energy, Environment and Water has pointed out that there are a lot of benefits which people are telling us vis-a-vis -vis these smart meters. Close to 2700 urban households have been given these prepaid or postpaid smart meters across six states. In this, what we've seen is that half of the reported improvements have been in the billing regularity. Basically, half of the users have been able to understand their bill better and they're paying their bills in a more regular manner. Two thirds are paying their bills in a much more easier way because of the app itself. Further, 40% of users are telling us that they have a better understanding of their energy expense and how electricity theft and power supply can be improved in the locality because they all understand how they're using their electricity. More than that, 70% want to recommend it to their relatives or friends. And it's a very confident and very encouraging way in which we are getting the data that yes, people are finding the logic and finding the basic smart meters useful. So better billing, regular billing, energy theft, further energy consumption, 
how localities need to be transferred, when is their peak, when is their when the consumption goes down, that way the discom companies can also shift the load according to the consumption itself, so that data can be used by both consumers and the discom, con uh, the discom companies itself. So therefore, when they know that it's a peak at a certain point of time, the load can be sent to that locality, and at a different locality, that, that load is very less, so they can use it in a certain way, so that there is no need for power cuts itself. So it's a very encouraging trend that way. This data is to just give you a basic perspective of how smart metering can change and is changing everything. But then, then, how do we make sure that the potentiality of smart metering is actually absorbed and we make sure that smart metering becomes the future of Indian energy consumption? Therein, there are four steps which have been pointed out. I'll give you the four steps first and then we'll go into the integrity. The four step process is every stakeholder has to now step up, wherein the Ministry of Power and the DISCOMs have to come together, but the Ministry first has to educate, which is it has to educate everybody about the concept of smart metering, what are the benefits of smart metering, so that they can shift to smart metering, have to download the app itself, and it needs to go to everybody. It should not be an urban thing, it should be urban, rural, everywhere. So it's about ministry educating, first step. Second step is by the DISCOM or the, the companies which give us the electricity, energy provider. They have to install and installation is very, very important because it's a very difficult process to go into certain remote areas and generally it is happening under what is called advanced metering infrastructure service providers. It's a little bit expensive, they have to incentivize it also. So they have to install it so that the second step itself is there, that everybody has access to smart meters and the demand is also met by the supply. Thereafter, the third step is again by the DISCOMs and here it is about creating a data set which is useful, which is useful. What do I mean by that? Because if they give us, if they give us a certain amount of data, which is of no set, no point or of no use to me, they're giving me overall load this and that, it match, that doesn't matter. If they're giving me a data set in which there is no mention of what, how I am using my energy, there's no point only. So the data set and data produced by the smart meter needs to be in a format which is useful to you and me as a consumer. And last but not the least is going to be the policy makers they have to incentivize and create a regulation or regulatory mechanism in which they can actually in which they can actually promote and create a certain environment in which smart meters can become the larger metering future of india so there are four steps which the article is pointing out this is very very important for you because this is a ready made answer for you vis a vis a mains question how do you how do you harness the potentiality, ministries have to educate, DISCOMs have to install, DISCOMs have to give us a data set which makes sense and policy makers have to create regulations and regulatory mechanism which incentivizes this whole concept itself. So we can go into the nitty gritty, very simply first, Ministry of Power should drive nationwide campaign, educate the consumers about the benefits, make them download the app and it should be accessible to everybody. Then the DISCOM, the companies which give us energy, should co-own a program and have a very important driving seat role in the, in, in the larger installation because they are the ones who will install it in every household. And they have to give a certain timeline in which they can install it also. There needs to be a future plan in that regard. Further, further, third is that they give us a scalable data solution wherein the data is used in such a way, in an innovative way, so that actually it gives us the potentiality to use it for better data consumption and for better energy consumption. And last but not the least is going to be policy makers and regulators who have to strengthen the regulatory mechanism which will empower the consumer to use this and generally they have to create the environment in which they phase out the old concept which is a paper bill, the concept of recharging, the buffer time rebates and they have to make it more simplified. Everything can be perfect, but if the regulatory mechanism is not there, it makes no sense in, in that regard. So, so this article is extremely important. 
because it says that in the decarbonizing world with green technology, the smart metering is the future, is the solution, and it is going to be a critical moment or a critical concept for using our, our data better, our energy better, energy management, cost effective. Further, we need to have a user-centric design and deploy a philosophy wherein we don't give discoms too much power, but the consumer. So before we move on to the next article, which is based on the Go Air crisis itself, let's try to understand what we understood in the first half an hour. First, we've understood the concept of SCO and G20, the obstacles which are there for India generally because of the presence of Russia, China and Pakistan, all three together. Now this article is the more interesting one. GS paper 3 talks about how smart metering is the future of India and more than that, how there have been benefits which have been which have been coming from or is based on the feedback from consumers. Third, the major point which is most important for you in the examination is how do, do we harness the potentiality of smart metering wherein the four step process, the policy makers, the DISCOM, the ministry and the DISCOM again have to do something. The ministry has to educate, the policy makers have to create a regulation and the DISCOMs have to give us the right data set and further install it in the right time frame itself. So I hope that you understand the importance of this article in your preparation generally and what is the basic point it's trying to make. Two very interesting questions, two very interesting answers already made up for you if they come in the examination. It's a very ready-made answer in that regard. Now, with this, let's move to the last mains-oriented or mains and prelims-oriented topic, which is the Go Air crisis and Go Airlines, which has now become the first airline to seek bankruptcy protection after the COVID-19 pandemic. Now, everybody would argue that it was bound to happen. But the point is, how do we understand the systemic issues? Because if we don't understand the systemic issues in this sector, then this is going to happen to a lot of different airlines. So the first point is, if you asked Go Air, why did it happen? They will say that our fleet was more or less grounded because of a technical issue in their engines, which was being provided by the Airbus by a certain provider which is there for the engine. So you would know that Airbus does not make its, it makes the plane, but it does not make the engines. Engines either come from Bentley or from Rolls-Royce, but the one they were using was the Pratt and Whitney. Whitney engines which were put in into the, into the Airbus uh, flights itself. So the plane itself, everything, the fuselage is made by Airbus, but you have three major providers vis-a-vis -vis your engine. You have Rolls-Royce, Bentley or Boeing itself makes a little bit of it and thereafter the last but not the least is this Pratt & Whitney. Pratt & Whitney was the major supplier to, to go air and now what has happened is that their engines have shown a major snag in that regard. Half of the fleet has been grounded. So they're saying that we don't have the potentiality to use our airlines or airplanes generally for the traffic which is there in India. However, that is a very myopic or short-term perspective of what has happened to Go Air. Now, why are we discussing Go Air and this crisis? Because it gives us a larger perspective on how this sector itself is flawed and how it is getting impacted by geopolitics also. Go Air argues that it is basically a post-COVID technical snag in its engines given by Pratt & Whitney under the Airbus agreement. However, what we want to argue and what this article is arguing is that it's, it's much more systemic. The systemic concept is, see, this sector is plagued by a lot of issues. First is that it is a very capital intensive sector, wherein a lot of money is needed and you will burn that money, you will burn that cash at a certain given amount of time because it will take time to reach profitability and for example, for example, Akasa is also saying that it is in the burning phase. Maybe it will become profitable when it will become that. Second is that it is a very competitive, very competitive sector wherein you have multiple providers, Indigo, Istara, all are there. And competitive sector wherein the bracket of what is called cheap or affordable 
airlines there are again multiple actors and therefore it's a competitive environment if there's one flight you ground it will have a major impact on your revenue then the problem is that the ukraine crisis itself created the problem of air turbine fuel which is that the specific type of kerosene which is used in the aeroplanes the air turbine fuel the cost has gone up the rate and the cost has gone up significantly because of the energy crisis itself further if you add to it the covid-19 pandemic did not help because then they had to ground their basic basic fleet and then if you add to all of this the problem when the engines then you actually get a larger perspective of why goer is going under and why there is much more systemic issues to this sector than just the engine itself engine may have been a very important contributing factor but even before that issue came through there was already capital burning goer was not profitable and generally struggling very competitive sector and with the cost going up a cheap or affordable airline cannot actually transfer it to the to the consumers if it does then what is the point of being affordable and therefore goer is a very good example of how this segment is problematic and there needs to be a change in the framework itself because we are not allowing affordable actors to work because of the fact that we have a certain regime which does not allow for incentivization of new actors first and second it is a very cash burning area so the article tries to point out very small but very interesting is that goer should be a alarm bell for the government of india for this sector to understand the systemic causes one small issue or one major issue can just destroy airlines and the bankruptcy filed by goer and the the way they have they are cancelling the flights is very very significant that way so the reason which goer will argue is the ever increasing number of failing engines which is a safety hazard in itself provided by the pratt and whitney under the airbus fleet which which was grounded because of this engine issue however the if you look at the larger perspective this is the short term perspective the financial issues of the go first or go air generally was already there was already there where in the fleet troubles the pandemic all created a mess for them but the problem here is not that it is just the pandemic or the engine which has impacted it's rather rather high capital intensive sector high operational cost more than that more than that very very thin margins so they are not able to gain a profit itself further further in the budget sector it is quite competitive and with aggressive pricing and aggressive marketing it was already clear that go first go air whatever was actually very 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 vulnerable very very vulnerable and if you add to it the lockdown the ukraine crisis and the air turbine fuel cost going up it was clear it was clear that in the post pandemic world go first was going to become the first provider to actually go under and file for bankruptcy and it did not help that the engine issues also came into the same period in which they were finding it very difficult to manage the demand and even have the right number of planes operating in that demand now the government knows that this industry is based on problematic foundations with you have atf cost prohibitive pricing itself a regulatory apparatus which is outdated wherein you are not allowing the market to decide how people will act further the operational costs are very high capital intensive sector so therefore a long term policy solution is needed and we need to make sure that this is the last major airline in india which would go into bankruptcy so before i move to the prelims bite section which is going to be smaller articles oriented towards prelims let's try to understand the three major articles we've discussed first is sco and the g20 issues related to the obstacles russia china ukraine uh, russia china ukraine and in a way pakistan but specifically pakistan china and russia coming together second article was based on the smart metering concept wherein we tried to understand how smart meters are the future and a four step program 
policy, the ministry is educating people, then installation, then the concept of using a data set which is useful, and last but not the least is a policy framework which incentivizes it. And then we move to the third article which is about a concerning trend in the airline sector wherein there is consolidation, but if these small these players are going to go under because of the regulatory mechanism, there's a need to change the regulatory mechanism generally. Because then, then in that regard, the first and foremost point is we don't have the right regulatory framework or the infrastructural framework and even the right pricing framework to actually support what are called affordable airlines. And India as of right now is going through a major shift in which people are preferring flights over trains on long distance and therefore it is an important sector, has the potentiality to be a major, major sector vis-a-vis -vis the world itself. So it's a very important wake up call for the government of India generally. So three topics we've discussed, all three related to one related to GS Paper 2 and two related to the rather two related to GS Paper 2 and one related to GS Paper 3 and now we'll move to the prelim section. Smaller articles, interesting, straightforward and you have to just know the basic points so that you can ace it in the examination. So first, is this new project which the Indian Army has launched which is called Project Sanjay now under Project Sanjay, the government of India and the army are developing with the help of BEL, Bharat Electronics Limited, what is called battlefield surveillance systems, wherein, wherein army at all levels, be it the commander to the ground corps level itself, to the person on the ground, they can use the new technology to get real time common operating picture and information and data which can be used via sensors and inputs which are there in the environment itself to create a comprehensive surveillance of the battlefield and the way we can take quick decisions based on this data. So BEL has been developing certain integrated systems within the uniforms and what the soldiers can carry and they have been testing it in different terrains in which it's just the basic point is that when the soldier is on the ground and there's a certain order from the commander, there's a gap of data as of right now. They are communicating through wireless, what we call as wireless sets and the, but that is also tappable, that is also problematic. So what Project Sanjay is trying to do is trying to link the commander with the person on the ground and creating a certain data set of information which can be relayed back for better decision making. So we can track our troops on the ground. Further, we have the ability to understand the environment in which they are working. And if there is something unforeseen, we can change our course of action. So it's called battlefield surveillance, wherein it's not that our troops are fighting and we have no idea itself. We should have a certain relay of information so that we understand the battlefield better. So Project Sanjay is what you have to remember here for the examination generally, battlefield surveillance systems, BSS. Now. Let's move to the second one, which is a EU tax, which is becoming going to become problematic. So EU is going to introduce from January of 2026, a tax, which is called carbon border adjustment mechanism, wherein, for example, for example, this is the EU border. There's a producer in, in the EU countries, for example, in Germany, he uses green technology he also uses green infrastructure to produce, for example, a car which costs, for example, $20,000. However, an Indian manufacturer can import a car, exact car, but that for only 10,000 pounds or 10, let's keep it at euro, at 10,000 euros. So you have 20,000 euros and you here you have 10,000 euros. So in a way the Indian manufacturer has a competitive uh, advantage because he is using or he she is using old technology which is not green but because it is cheaper it is able to keep the production cost down and therefore when the car is imported into Germany their own car costs them 20,000 20, euros. On the other hand the Indian car costs only 10,000 euros. So therefore, therefore, 
India has a comparative advantage and generally an advantage in the sector, hypothetical situation. Now what the carbon border adjustment mechanism is going to do, that if a manufacturer is not using green technology or green what we call as infrastructure, then there will be a tax which will be or custom which will be applied at the border so as to make this car competitive in India also. To have to make this environment competitive in India also, in, your, in, in Germany also. So that basically this 20,000 euro does not seem big. So that they will apply more or less close to 5,000 to 6,000 euro custom so, so as to give the indigenous or a person who is using green technology an equally good opportunity vis-a-vis -vis and manufacture coming from any other country. It's not just India, it's just that it's about a monitoring mechanism where imports from producers who are deploying non-green technologies starting from October to January of 2026 will now there will be a tax levy on them. And therefore, Indian manufacturers, specifically in the metal and engineering product sector, are very concerned. So this concept is very, very simple. Germany, an indigenous manufacturer, produces a car vis-a-vis -vis green technology and green infrastructure, only cost 20,000 euros. But it was expensive than any other thing because the green technology was expensive. An Indian manufacturer or a Vietnam manufacturer or a Chinese manufacturer imports a car into the EU at half the cost because it is using the old technology. So in order to offset and encourage the green technology and green infrastructure, they are going to levy a tax at the border so as to make the EU manufacturer also competitive and incentivize adoption of green technology and green infrastructure. So this is a concern because now India has to find a way to cope with this challenge because our small Indian exporters don't have the capacity. One thing should be very, very clear. In Indian manufacture, exporting, for example, to the EU, a small one does not have the capacity to go for all green technology. That is a given. So now the point is maybe big companies can shift to greener technologies. This is going to remove the advantage which India has, as it is will make the product very expensive in the EU. So therefore, therefore, the point is now we are looking for options how to counter it, either to take it to the WTO or a retaliatory tariff mechanism in which we are also taxing their products in India. The simple point is our medium and small Indian exporter is going to struggle after January 2026, wherein, wherein there will be there will be a major tax which is going to be pushed in for non-green technology based industries and producers. This is going to be a problem. And as of right now, they are going to monitor from October, but from January of 2026, they will start to apply it also. So within the next three years, we need to find a solution. So it's a very simple concept. EU's carbon tax plan is based on taxing who produces in a more polluting way, which is non-green technology. On the other hand, the other spectrum is that we as Producers don't have the capacity to shift to green technology. A small Indian exporter can't. And therefore, we have three years to figure out how can we cope with this problem. So it's a very interesting concept. We'll, be keep, we'll keep on developing. Let's see where we take it in the larger context of our preparation and generally for the government of India where they take it in with regards to how they cope with it. So we've discussed two basic concepts, products, Project Sanjay, wherein we try to understand the concept of surveillance technology in the battlefield and now the EU tax plan and how we are going to cope with it. This is your current affairs. We will see how we go forward after this. Thereafter, a metal which we all love, gold, the demand has actually falled and that is a very big thing. There is a major demand fall vis-a-vis -vis the Q1 itself in 2023, 17%. And uh, it is both good for the Indian economy because we import most of our gold. So this 17% shrinkage or fall in the way we are demanding gold across the world is both encouraging but also, also this means that in the later stages of the year it may go up. Now the point is you need to understand why. And the reason is very simple. 
64,000 gold was just recently and therefore, therefore the prices of gold which has shot up record high has led to the households postponing their purchases expecting a price correction which is that as it is as it is if demand will fall and supply will remain the same the the, the price should go down but gold defies most of the logic because smuggling then matches that demand shot however the fact of the matter is as of right now this is just based on postponement it's an artificial decrease it's not an organic decrease wherein the demand has generally fallen this is a very prelims oriented topic for you for a simple reason you need to understand how gold flow matters and we have also become price sensitive so previously it used to happen gold is 67,000 no one cares but now we have become price sensitive wherein if it's reaching a price high we understand that there will be price correction so this is about two things both behavior of the consumer and secondary demand which we are giving to the world vis-a-vis -vis gold so a 17 percent shrinkage is good but as i said it is based on an artificial decrease because it's postponement so therefore as soon as the prices will cool down a little bit then again the demand will shoot up and when the demand will shoot up and the supply will remain the same again the prices will rise so it's becoming a basic cycle of people waiting for the price to go down but as soon as it reaches down then the demand shoots up we as indians have to change our behavior that way is because we import most of our gold but that is not going to happen because somehow gold is considered a very important investment and generally has cultural value more than anything in India. So this is about telling two things, shortage in demand, but artificial based on basically prices. Then two small topics, very small topics. First is we are now trying to reorient our basic strategy vis-a-vis strategy -vis the atomic sector. So as of right now in the atomic sector in nuclear power plants, there is no foreign investment allowed fpi fdi nothing so there's a ban on foreign investment in the nuclear sector however the niti ayog and the government generally is considering removing this ban so as to allow for domestic manufacturers plus certain type of what we call as partnership between foreign country foreign companies and indian companies to boost the nuclear sector see solar energy is a very good alternative nuclear is being phased out in Germany in the EU quite a lot but because nuclear power can be produced 24 7 and our current capacity at 6000 megawatt there's a lot of potentiality for nuclear to go forward it has its own hazards it has its own problems but India is as of right now considering removing the ban on foreign direct investment wherein certain private firms in india can get money from abroad and also the technology and the expertise to create a much higher percentage of nuclear power in india now this has its own problems it has its own advantages yes nuclear power is more reliable than solar but solar has its own advantages it is not toxic it has no major scare of disaster nuclear disaster in itself is major problem chernobyl if you have if you know basically is a very good example of how nuclear power plants can be dangerous and last but not the least is foreign direct investment should come with technology transfer if it is only foreign direct investment or foreign investment generally it is going to be a problem so india is pushing for clean energy we are reconsidering our strategy vis-a-vis -vis, vis -vis nuclear technology because atomic sector as of right now no foreign investment is allowed in that regard with this, we move to the last topic and we'll, then I'll give you a summary and we can move to the main questions. There was a scheme which was called the National Program for Prevention and Control of Cancer, Diabetes, Cardiovascular Disease and Strokes. It was called the NPC DCS. And uh, it's a scheme which used to operate under the National Health Mission itself. However, the Ministry of Health has now reconsidered the fact that just by saying that it is a scheme for these things, it does not include all the major new diseases which are coming through via lifestyle. For example, non-alcoholic fatty liver issue, chronic kidney disease 
and therefore there was a need to change the name of the scheme it's a very simple concept where in non communicable diseases which can be prevent which can be prevented and can be controlled the scheme needs to represent that so for you for your prelims examination what is important the fact that the national program for can cancer diabetes cardiovascular disease and strokes has now been renamed as national program for prevention and control of non communicable diseases so it is now being called np ncd so in the examination if you get this concept that it's a scheme under the national health mission it is just a renamed scheme it the basic point is it is a non communicable disease based on mostly lifestyle and generally problems we face as sedentary lifestyle so therefore therefore this is the new scheme name so what you have to remember is this fact only this fact only so i hope everything till this point has made sense to you i'll give you the summary of all the topics we've done today and then i'll move to the main question first we discussed the sco and the g20 presidency obstacles china russia and generally pakistan presence in the both in both organizations is problematic and therefore india has to find a way to maneuver it second we discussed the smart metering concept wherein smart metering is going to be the future but there needs to be a regulatory mechanism which allows for installation education and better data sets which can be used for people which can be used by people to use their electricity better which is for a greener future third we discussed the go first issue and how it is not just the pratt and whitney engines but rather the systemic issue in the sector capital intensive operational costs are very high air turbine fuel the pricing mechanism is also problematic then we move to the prelims bite section and then we understood project sanjay project sanjay was based on battlefield surveillance and bel is creating the sensors and the equipment to do that so as to create a better understanding of the battlefield itself thereafter we understood gold and gold 17% dip but artificial dip because everybody is postponing because price as is the highest therefore there will be up and down in prices that is going to be based on the demand and supply generally then we move to this renaming of this project or this program which was based on non communicable diseases the npncd which is non communicable diseases prevention and control we also tried to understand how there's a new eu tax which is going to impact our consumer because these consumers or rather is going to impact our producers in a way that eu is going to put in a tax where no non green technology if it is used they will tax the the producer more and green technology if it is used there will be no tax so therefore an exporter from india will now face issues in exporting to the eu because the eu is going to apply from 2026 a tax if you are a non green producer or non green technologies using producer so we've again created a plethora of different small topics but important in that regard last but not the least we discuss the new reconsideration in the nuclear sector so i hope everybody is clear with regards to these eight topics we've discussed today and now i can move to the main questions everything is perfect you understand everything right perfect great so two main questions for your practice discuss the challenges which india faces as the president of g20 and the leader of the sco very standard very simple a talk about india we we'll talk about india china india pakistan india russia and the india us complex thereafter smart metering is the is crucial for india's electricity revolution comment this is about potentiality of smart metering how can we harness it so i hope all these topics made sense to you i'll be there tomorrow again with another set of issues thank you so much and I'll see you tomorrow. Take care. Bye-bye.